Hey everyone, Russell Gray, co-host of the Real Estate Guys radio show here in episode two of our eight part series in organizing your business to scale. And we're talking today about prioritizing and the role of prioritizing and scaling your business. And so joining us to uh, help us uh, understand how to do that is Stacy Gray from Organize to Scale. Hey, Stacy. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Yep, it's fun. So uh, we've had a, a good time in kind of our introductory video and then the first video that we did. And now we're here on video number two. You don't necessarily have to watch them in order, but if you want to, they're all down below in the show notes. And as we release them, we'll add to that. Uh, and so, but e each one can kind of be watched in its own module. But um, Stace, kind of explain this concept of prioritizing and the role it plays in scaling. Yeah, so building a business, building and scaling a business, there are so many things to do. You think of sales and marketing and operations and tech and legal and finance and accounting and team building and brand building. And it's like, where do I even begin? How do I really build and scale a business and not get trapped in operational chaos? And how can I work through people but not break the bank? And so you have to prioritize. And you don't have to do everything at once. And having spent a lot of time in with the syndicators in your program, the Syndication Mentoring Club, I, we've witnessed people feel like, oh, I have to have a website. I have to have all my social media. I have to have a logo. I have to have a brand name. I have to have all these things in order to actually build a syndication business. And then we have folks who have none of those things and build their syndication business. So there really is an MVP or a minimum viable product that can be created to get you from the idea of having a syndication business to actually generate raising capital and doing a deal in a short time frame. And it's first getting it out of your brain. So getting everything that you think you need to do out because otherwise you're going to be in the shower, awake at night, thinking about it and it's stressing you out. So just get it all out on paper. And then we have to go through and say, what do you personally feel you have to have in order to build your business? Because everyone is different. Yes, we can, we can sit here and project and say, you only need these things. But there's some people that have so much fear and resistance that if they don't have a website or if they don't have an email address, they just won't move forward. Yeah. So, well, you just said a magic word say, so I'm going to interject. Uh, you use the word resistance. And so if you've not read the book, Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield, uh, or even the uh, War of Art, but really Turning Pro is the better book in terms of this topic. Uh, Pressfield talks about this concept of resistance. And just to be very blunt about it, what happens is we hide behind all these things we pretend we think we have to do, not so we don't have to face the things that we really do have to do. And, and what it is, the reason we don't want to face it is because we feel like if we go do it and we fail, we failed. And I think that what you really have to learn, what I've learned is what I learned from Tom Hopkins, that the failure isn't failure. It's only feedback. It's part of the process. It's an iterative process of finding out what works, what doesn't work, what you like, what you don't like. We talked a little bit about that uh, in the previous episode about developing your personal syndication philosophy. So failure is actually part of the process. It's part of the feedback. And so it's more about being a researcher and being curious uh, and so you just have to start experimenting. But I will say this also, I had an opportunity to be a guest on Gary Keller's uh, podcast, and he's not the host, Jeff, uh, Jeff Woods is his name, is the host of it about the one thing. But the one thing, if you're not familiar with Gary Keller's book, the, the one thing is about the idea is what is the one thing, the focusing question, what is the one thing that I can do that will make everything else that I have to do either uh, easier or unnecessary? And so part of that process that Stacey's describing of getting out everything that you think you have to do out on the paper, there's two filters. First filter is what am I hiding behind, right? What am I pretending I need to have that I don't really need to have? And you, you could be convinced I absolutely cannot do it unless I have, you know, this and that. And then Stacey can give you examples of people that have raised millions of dollars and they didn't even have a business name yet. I mean, we've got people in our program like that. I'm not saying you should do that. We all have our different things. You know, I think you do have to have enough uh, of whatever you feel that you have to have in order to have confidence to go out in the marketplace. So there, there is a little bit of that. 
And you just have to be brutally honest with yourself. Uh, so that's filter number one. Filter number two is just understanding the, the, the big scope of everything that it is you think you need to do. So you can start to pick out the leverage where if I do this one thing, it will advance three or four or five other things or make them unnecessary. And all of a sudden, all this chaos, all this clutter, all this this anxiety that is running around in your mind and this, these papers and these notes and stuff that are everywhere. I know because I've lived that life many, many times, all starts to come into focus. And then once you do that, now people can begin to see what you're feeling and you can too, and you can begin to develop a plan around that. So Stace, um, you, you, you started talking a little bit about the process before I interrupted you, but I just felt like I wanted to talk about that resistance concept and understanding why it is so important to submit to this process. So people put everything out on the table. Where do you go from there? And then we identify, well, previously we have identified their sweet spot. So we know what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And so we take all of the things that they know they're going to do and they would wake up and do it anyways and give it to them to do because they will feel like they're making progress. They will feel like things are happening. It will boost their confidence. It will create momentum. And we know that building and scaling a business requires momentum. You can have negative momentum and you can have positive momentum and you have to be able to create positive momentum. And when you get knocked off, be resilient enough to get back up and keep pushing until you can get that positive momentum going again. If you're stuck in a negative momentum cycle, you have to put a timeline on it. And negative momentum is momentum is paralysis analysis. We have a lot of folks that just analyze and analyze and analyze, but never execute. Well, that's not a business. You don't have a business. You have a research company that doesn't generate any revenue. So there has to be a timeline or a deadline to it. So you can have a laundry list and you can say, oh, oh, I need all these things to make myself feel comfortable. Yes. Okay. Well, you can have it within 10 days. If you don't have it within 10 days, we're executing with minimum viable product. And so you have to keep pushing to create that momentum because if you don't, you're never, you will never build your syndication business. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, minimum viable products. Since we're talking specifically about syndication, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to give my definition and then you can add color to it. Um, but to me, uh, if this is a business of raising money, which is what syndication is, then you have to get the minimum uh, amount of, of uh, infrastructure and resources together to be able to go raise money. And because this is a business of compliance and legalities, um, you have to make sure that you do have those things in place. There's no law that says you have to have a website. There's no law that says that you have to have a personal assistant. There's no law that says you have to have a certain type of software. Those things are nice. And some of them you may feel are necessary, but if you really boil it down, what you have to have is a deal and offering documents, bank accounts, legal structure to be compliant, to take money. And, you know, if you can think about uh, just doing a deal with a friend where you say, well, you've known me my whole life and, you know, here's a deal that we'd like to do together. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just kind of map out an agreement. And so we understand each other and then uh, you send me some money and I'll go do the deal right now. There's some, some legalities. And so we're not giving you legal advice here. But you, that's, that's all you really have to have is a relationship with a potential investor, a deal that would attract their capital and enough documentation for you to be compliant and actually be able to take the check and go sign a contract to do the deal. That's the minimum viable product from my perspective. Of course, mm -hmm. people do need a little bit more to have a level of confidence. And this is, again, where I think you have to be brutally honest with yourself about whether, whether this is something that you have to have or whether you're hiding. And you only you really know the answer. But if you hang around enough people and you open up and you're really willing to be mentored, if you will, um, then what will happen is people will start to call you out. So, Stace, I know that you've done some of that. Certainly you do that with me. Uh, which I have always appreciated, you know, she calls BS on some of my, you know, hiding when I've got something that I want to do that for whatever reason, I've got resistance. Uh, if you read Stephen Covey, I mean, uh, Stephen Pressfield's book, you'll understand that. Um, but you have to have people in your life that are going to do that. And you have to have uh, not just the people, but you have to have the touch points and the processes and the permissions in place uh, so that all of that can happen. So uh, I know that's a little bit more philosophical, but Stace, why don't you talk a little bit about 
how that works because you can't set priorities for the team um, if you're not willing to do what you're supposed to do as the leader. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. Um, the, I want to just back up and add to what you were saying MVP was, which will circle back to answering your question. I think in addition to the things that you said, I think the one other thing that you need is a network. So people, this is why the syndication mentoring club is so valuable, but someone you can fall back on and call when you don't know what to do. So you're not going to have it all figured out. And this is where people feel like, oh, I'm just going to sit in the education seat and keep learning and learning and learning, but not do. So you're going to be out over your skis. You're going to have your, your bank account, your operating agreement. You're going to have a deal and you're going to have, you're going to have capital. And then you're going to be like, oh crap, what do I do? And if you sit and wait for you, you personally to have all the answers, you won't do it, but you just need to be able to have somebody, your Rolodex that you can pick up the phone and call. And that's advisors, that's peers, that's people doing the same thing. So I think plugging into something like that, and it, it could be the syndication mentoring club, it could be another program that that is, I would say the other MVP piece, because that will guide you through anything that may came, come up in growing your syndication business that you won't know about right now. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. Um, because that's why we created the program. I know exactly what it's like to be that person who wants to do a good job for my investors, who doesn't want to make a mistake, who doesn't want to practice when I don't know what I'm doing unsupervised. I would never want to go in for a major surgery and have a doctor who's doing it for their very first time without having an experienced surgeon standing right by their side. I don't mind necessarily having someone because everybody has to learn and there is maybe some um, benefits of dealing with somebody who's new and enthusiastic and uh, got time and attention, maybe uh, he's got the latest training and all of those different things. But you want to make sure that somebody who's been there, done that experience, who knows how to navigate and keep their emotional wits about them, if something goes sideways, uh, that is really, really important. And so, you know, we created a, a a community, if you will, uh, to provide that for folks. And there's a lot of other communities out there. This isn't a sales pitch for our particular program. This is just understanding that, uh, to Stacy's point, this is a hugely important part of your ability to get out and go do business and yet be thoroughly responsible, uh, you know, for, for doing a good job for people. Uh, and that is, you're only going to be as good as the team you build. So one of the very first things you do is get that team built. You can go do it painstakingly one person at a time over however long it takes, or you can plug into something that already exists and then maybe just supplement that when you uh, find your specific needs, uh, aren't, aren't met and you need somebody, you know, uh, maybe a little niche, you know, maybe you picked a particular market or investment, um, uh, class or, or, or program where you're going to need somebody that isn't available in the, in the program uh, that, that you're part of or the programs. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't be involved in multiple as far as I'm concerned, because anytime as a syndicator, you're in a group of people who are out there looking for deals and raising money and solving problems. The more of those groups you're in, just one idea, one relationship, one opportunity should easily pay for the cost of being in the program if you're actively participating in building those relationships. So excellent, excellent point, Stace. Thanks for bringing it up. So back to your original question, which I believe was, how do you keep a leader on track when they aren't being accountable to what they said they needed to do? Um, I think first it starts with radical honesty. So as the visionary or leader or entrepreneur, you need to have radical honesty with yourself. You know, you know what your strengths and weaknesses are and don't pretend like you don't. And everyone around you sees it. So if you aren't just being honest about it, it doesn't build trust with your team because they are already seeing it and you just need to say it. Then once you have that radical honesty with yourself, like, hey, I am a good starter, but I am not a good finisher. Then you al align with people who are good finishers and you say, hey, I am not a good finisher, but I'm a great starter and I want to start these things. Can you help me finish and hold me accountable? I give you full permission to do that. And then you let them do that for you because they are serving your highest vision and mission for what you want to do in alignment with your values, which is then 
getting your message out to the world, which is contribution and significance in it allows you not to hide behind your resistance and you really serve. So it's partnering with people that you trust that you can have those radical, honest conversations with that you know that they're not going to take advantage of your vulnerabilities. And instead, they're going to support you in your vulnerability so that you can serve. It comes back to this concept of priorities. And if your priority is protecting your own ego, if your priority is hiding your own inadequacies, if your priority is projecting on others to obfuscate your own failings, you're going to fail. Your priority has to be the success of the enterprise and the mission, even over and above your own ego. I know this from experience, and it's, it, it, it's very difficult to deal with people and build a team around people whose ego is more important than getting the job done. The fact of the matter is you just have to be comfortable with the fact that you're a human being and you're a package deal as all human beings are, right? We have, uh, all, each of us have tremendous skills, tremendous potential, tremendous innate abilities. We have giftings and interests and curiosities and drives that make us uniquely human. The flip side of that is we all have failings and inadequacies and things we're not good at and we're not interested in. And to pretend that those don't exist is foolish to try to convince yourself that somehow, especially if you're older, like I am, that somehow, some way you're going to figure that out and change. The probability of that is small. So better to leverage what you do well and augment yourself with people. But the priority has to be for everybody on the team, including yourself, getting the job done for the sake of the mission, for the sake of the team, for the sake of the marketplace, and understanding that if your model is correct, that your personal goals will be achieved as long as your personal priority isn't to be perfect, to mm -hmm. be adored, to be the infallible person in the room. If your ego is so big that you cannot get out of your own way, it's just going to be really, really hard. So priority number one is to relinquish the throne of perfection and accept your humanity and then go to work on the mission as part of a team and just as you are going to use your strengths to help people who maybe don't have your entrepreneurial grit. The people who are going to work in your organization don't have their own businesses because they don't have the same chops, the same drive that you have. Doesn't make them less than you, doesn't make you better than them. It just makes them different and complementary. And this is really the key. And when we get into talking in, uh, I think the next video, we're going to be talking about uh, the concept of a sweet spot, finding your own sweet spot and putting everybody in their own sweet spot. Part of that is based on, you know, your personal syndication philosophy, which we covered in video number one. Sec second thing is getting that out and then setting priorities, not just strategic priorities about the one thing or how to leverage or which order to do thing or how to manage limited resources. But the bigger priority is, is how to have each person and have their own individual priorities meld into uh, the, the, the enterprise priorities and your priorities as, a, uh, as the visionary and then recognizing that, you, well, you're a visionary, you're probably also a team member. And those are two different seats to sit in. So when I am operating as a team member, uh, I'm a peer with the other people who are depending on me for output to get a job done. Uh, and then when I'm in the visionary seat, of course, I sit in that by myself and I use feedback that people give me to refine my vision, but ultimately the vision buck stops with me. So there's a difference between the operational buck when I'm on the team, which is you subordinate to the team and the processes and all the things you create as a visionary. And this is process of working on your business, as Michael Gerber says, and then stepping in and working in your business, subordinating to the very vision that you created when you were working on your business. Did that kind of come out right, Stace? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a balance because you, when you, as a visionary, it can be very challenging to come back in and be in the operational system. And because visionaries like innovating, they like to come back into operations and re-innovate things that are already working. So it's a constant balance of keeping the infrastructure that is working in place and giving the visionary the outlet to really be strategic in a creative sense that is forward and outward facing.
Yeah. And then, and then the other part is the idea of, of that elusive 10%. I used to have a manager that helped me because I am a recovering perfectionist. And what happens, he'd say, Russ, you know, excellent is good enough, right? The, the, the effort it's going to take to close the gap, that 90% that you've got to your excellent, that gap, that extra 10% to go from excellent to perfect is going to take you know, 110% of your time and effort, the return on effort is not there. You don't need to be perfect. You just need to be excellent. Mm -hmm. And that was freeing. That was liberating. I still struggle with it because I want everything perfect. I want to be in total control. I'm afraid of making a mistake because ultimately that frustration, that anxiety, perfectionism is just fear. And once you recognize that it's fear and you don't really have to be afraid, you have to learn to trust. You have to trust your team. You have to trust your priorities, your processes, and you have to trust that God didn't make any perfect human beings. There's not one out there, not one, right? And there's plenty of imperfect human beings that have achieved fabulous success, added tremendous value to the world and done a great job for people. You can do it too. And it all starts with getting your personal syndication philosophy, right? Getting yourself in the right environment with the right support team, setting good priorities, starting with your own ego, and then just understanding your role when you're working on your business, when you're working in your business. Uh, and then the next stop that we're going to cover uh, in, in the next video is this concept of sweet spot, because that's really the secret sauce of how you get everybody on the right seat on the bus. So any closing mm -hmm. thoughts, Stace? Yeah, I think one of the ways that we've actually dealt with your perfectionism, if we can just be candid, is we agree on what the vision is. And obviously we have a lot of trust in our relationship, but we, and you like visibility. Like you said, you're you kind of our control freak. I don't think, in, I think people, visionaries should have a level of control and they should have a lot of level of insight, but it should be in a way that's like a scorecard or metrics or things so they have visibility, but they're not in the weeds. And then in terms of execution, sometimes per perfectionism can halt execution. So what we do is we say, hey, you have two days or a week to have input on this. If we don't hear from you, we're executing with X, Y, and Z. And 99.9% .9 of the time, you say, just do what you were going to do. And so we can keep executing without having to be halted by the perfectionism because we've been doing this now. I've been doing it 20 years now with you, um, I pretty much know how you think, and I'm going to make a decision that is, is very much in alignment with what you would want. But I also respect your visionary seat, and I want to give you the permission to have your voice heard if that's um, necessary for that decision. And so I think finding somebody like our dynamic for you know, all of you out there watching this, that you can have that level of trust and um, in the visionary operator dynamic that allows you to prioritize and execute and minimizes all of the resistance that shows up in terms of paralysis of analysis or perfectionism um, can be really huge in scaling your business. And it doesn't have to take 20 years. And it doesn't, have to it doesn't have to take 20 years because if you go through this process, this three day process of being drawn out, if you if you, you know, are asked the right questions and are willing to answer them honestly, uh, and then you have this 90 day iterative process, then the people who are part of that with you are getting to know you very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And they're building uh, around proven processes to share that information to the right people. And then you deal with their resistance also, again, by putting them in their sweet spot, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, but, but, um, but it's liberating. I can just tell you how it feels great to know that you've got somebody that gets you, that you can trust to make the right call almost every single time and they feel safe in making a mistake because they're just doing their best. And then I think, you know, what I've learned to do is just, if I didn't, if I had an opportunity to have a say and didn't have a say, then it's my fault if things didn't come out the way I wanted them because I didn't tell anybody what I wanted. And then I have to own that, but nobody's I, playing it. Nobody's playing a game of punishing you. It's like, Oh, you didn't get back to me. So I'm going to purposely do it badly so that you learn you need to get back to me. Right. You can't have that kind of game playing going on in a relationship in a business anywhere. It's, it's got, there's got to be, I think Stacy in your business, you have this, I can't remember exactly what you call it, but it's basically this, this, this uh, brutal honesty, you know, and it, it, it's not, it's not destructive honesty. It's constructive and loving, empathetic, but it's still out, on, on the table where people can deal with it. And that has to be a priority too. 
that's our culture. So our culture um, is all about high trust and high trust means I trust your character. I trust your competency. I trust your work ethic. I trust you to follow through on what you say you're going to do. And I trust that when things go sideways, because they will, that you are going to come to me directly and we're going to have an honest conversation. And that's our culture. And that's, that allows us to keep moving quickly. And like you said, you are going to make mistakes. Everyone is going to make mistakes, but you can trust that you are going to be able to recover from the mistake and learn from it and then build your business even greater because of that lesson that you learned. So I think that you, even if you can't control everything, you can still have trust in the process that you know that you can navigate any uncharted waters um, and still come out ahead. So if you feel like you've been drinking from a fire hose, it's because you have been. Um, what you're getting is the benefit of Stacy and I having worked together for 20 years and built several businesses and had a lot of ups and downs and failures. We went through 2008 together. She's helped many, many syndicators uh, solve many of these problems. And so you're listening to the voice of experience. Uh, but Stacey, you, you actually wrote a report to kind of just start people with some basics. And so what's the title of the report and what's in it? four tips for organizing your syndication business to scale. And it walks you through the four steps to really what, what I believe are the core pillars for organizing your business to scale. And there's some um, exercises in there that you can do so you can get clear on your syndication philosophy, figure out the gaps in terms of people and processes, what you have that's working, what's not working, and then how to eliminate that resistance so you can take action. And it's totally free. So, and it's really simple. Only four things to start out your focus on. Uh, so you can learn a little bit more about that. To get the free report, just send an email to scale at realestateguysradio.com, scale at realestateguysradio.com, and we will get it to you. And then we will see you in the next video where we're going to talk about the uh, something we call the sweet spot and the important role it plays in building a team that gets up every day and is on fire to do a great job for you and your customers. Thanks for watching. Before you go, three things. Number one, subscribe. When you subscribe, you build up our subscription base and that helps us reach more people, but even more important, it helps us attract great guests and subject matter experts to share their ideas and information with you. Number two, click that notification bell to make sure that when we do post a new video on this hot topic, you're notified right away. And number three, share. Please share this information with friends, help them get on board this bus, help them protect and preserve their wealth to take advantage of what's going on in the world today. All right. Thanks so much. And we'll see you in the next video.